We, we've got a returning guest today, Gillian Dumas from the Rose City Reader, and she's going to talk about her collection of Penguin Tri-Band Green Colored Books. What do you know about those? Well, I don't know a lot about those, but they are paperbacks that are primarily reprints of not just classics. The ones she has, a great many of them are mysteries, uh, Agatha Christie, um, you know, she's going to show us a lot of these and and tell us how she came by this huge collection. Um, it should be an interesting should be an interesting discussion. Well, I'm pretty sure that by the end of the show, both of us are going to know a whole lot more about penguin books. We might be trying to collect them ourselves by then. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and here we are for another edition of the Rare Book Cafe, the Coffee Break Edition, the book lover's rendezvous. And today we're rendezvousing with my co-host, Lee Lynn, Ridge Books, Calhoun, Georgia. Hello, Lee. Hello, Ed. I'm glad to be here this morning and delighted that we have our guest, Gillian Dumas, from Portland. Is that correct? It is, yes. Okay, good. Uh, and you really came on the show before. I was a while back. Yes, I'm okay. happy to be back. Yeah, and we're, we're glad to have you back. You back. <laughs> because this is the 16th anniversary of your um, hosting, uh, recording of of your not day job book mm -hmm. reading. Right. Well, I, I've been reading for longer than 16 years, but today is the <laughs> blog anniversary of my Rose City Reader book blog. I launched it today in 2008, which makes it pretty much a geriatric book blog. <laughs> and before we talk about that, I just want to say that to tell everybody that Gillian's day job is as an advocate for abused children. She's a lawyer who has um, resolved many cases in the direction of her clients. And I so appreciate that because there's nothing more important than justice and justice for children who can't protect themselves. Thank you for that, Gillian. Well, thank you, Ed. I, I appreciate those kind words. And Gillian and I met in person back in the Rose City, Portland, Oregon. The uh, Rose Festival is coming up in a month or two. And... Uh, Hey, as I recall, you read almost 300 books last year. Not quite. I'm, you know, so one of these days I will get to retire and then I might read that many. But last year I read about 150. That's still impressive. Yeah, it's still impressive. <laughs> still <laughs> almost one every other day. Uh, yeah. Well, I read a lot with my ears. So that helps, you know, while I'm doing the dishes or or going for a walk or, or you know, driving in the car. I, I, I'm always, I always have a book going. Good for you. Good for you. But the thing we wanted to talk about today is that collection that's on the wall behind you. Okay. Because right. not only are you a reader, you're a book collector. I Yeah, they kind of sometimes go hand in hand. You want me to show? You want me to? Love to see it. Okay. So... There we go. It goes. It's going and going and wow. going. Okay, so those are all penguin paperbacks. That's that's sort of a dedicated little area for those. Um, back in during the during the pandemic when we were locked down, lots of people did online shopping. I did online shopping myself, but my online shopping was for books, and I found a somebody selling a whole collection of those green ones. You can see the, the green ones there 
Uh, they call them tri-bands because of obvious reason, the three bands of, uh, you know, color on top and bottom and the white in the middle. And um, he was selling a collection of 400 of the green ones, which are the mystery series. And they're crime and, crime and mystery um, fiction for the most part. And they, um, and he was selling it from England with very cheap shipping for a couple of big boxes because usually you can't buy them from England because it costs so much to ship them over. Sometimes so much of the books themselves. Uh, yeah. Or more. Yeah. And so I, um, I grabbed that and it was my sort of pandemic project was sorting through all those and um, getting them entered into my book nerd spreadsheet and, uh, you know, getting them all cataloged. And yeah, and so then I've been now sort of slowly reading them, but I plan someday, of course, to just try to read them straight through and read, have a year of reading nothing but Penguin Paperback Mysteries. <laughs> what is the date range of them? So I, I should know more about this for being a, a dedicated Penguin Triband collector, but they, um, they start in the 30s and then they go six, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I found one on my shelf from 35. So mm -hmm. I thought it was 36 too, but um, mm -hmm. I have an older one. I pulled a couple out if you want me to show them to you. Love to. Okay. So for example, they kind of go in order. So this is the one from 1935. I don't know if the camera can see that. It is. Agatha Mysterious Christie. Affair at Styles by Agatha Christie. Yes, a, a Agatha Christie classic. And this is pro probably one of the oldest ones in the book. Um, and what is into it? So it says on the side here, I don't even know. I think it's a little bit glary, so I don't know if you can see it. But it says the Bodley Head. And that's what all the really old penguins uh, used to say because that was the name of the publishing company that turned into Penguin is my understanding. Keep in mind, I don't really, I, I don't get down too much in the weeds. But you see this Penguin guy is facing me. Here's another copy, an older and, and more recent edition of the same book. Now, that one switched to have, uh, it's also Mysterious Affair at Styles, but it says, mystery and crime on the side instead of boldly hit. They changed it. But, um, and then this one, interestingly, has a book jacket, which most of them didn't. They have paperback with a book jacket, kind of weird. I think that's called a French jacket, a, a, a French cover. A French cover. Okay. Oh, I like that. Okay. So what happens, though, is that the penguins themselves changed over time. Not only the the boldly head or mystery and crime here's seven dials mystery another one but the penguin is much littler and a little bit more tidy <laughs> and we've gone from um mystery and crime with an ampersand to mystery and crime with an and this is the geeky stuff that these penguin well is there a bibliography have you found a bibliography or are you learning this there online? are bibliographies online here's what i was trying to show you so here's where the penguins are even facing different directions and he's moving. And this one's he's dancing. Dance. Yeah, he's yeah, dancing. he's doing a little dance. So they change throughout time. And then eventually they got kind of standardized um, with nothing written here. The penguin is just kind of standing there. And this is, uh, this is a, um, you know, Death on the Nile. So it's a reprint trying to get a first, first edition. People collect penguin first editions. So it's not the first edition of the book necessarily, but it's the first time it came out in, as a penguin. I didn't get all into that because I was just getting that big, huge box on the boat. I didn't. I, I, I said, just send me what you have. So I'd say maybe about a third of mine are first editions and um, most are reprints. Um, Gillian, I just did a quick quick check while you were talking. You're yeah. Talking to the first printing were 10 books in August of 1935. Oh, okay. Well, that is interesting because I have a reprint of those 10 books that they reissued sometime in the 50s, which are right there. Um, but yeah, so that that's how they launched the series, but it was, of course, wildly popular. And most people know that um, 
Penguin really came into its own during World War II when uh, that when they were became sort of cheap mass market pop, uh, paperbacks that the soldiers could stick in their pocket and take with them. Um, but they're very hard to find over here because they were specifically published for um, England and um, Commonwealth nations. So they, you know, so the backs of them might say, well, they don't have prices on the backs, but inside it might say, you know, uh, England, Canada, uh, England and Australia, sometimes Canada, but they will say something like um, not available for sale in the U.S. or for copyright reasons, not available in the U.S., things like that. So, and even now, that's why it's much easier to find them in England than it is here in America. So what writers, uh, you've shown us Agatha Christie, what are some yeah. of the other writers included? Well, there's, I mean, every sort of classic age mystery writer that you can imagine, Nao Marsh, um, Josephine Tay, the, the queens of mystery are certainly in there. Dorothy Sayers. Dorothy Sayers. Yes. And in fact, I have some Dorothy Sayers to show you. Um, and then Earl Stanley Gardner. They had American authors, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, all the classics. But they have, before I get to the Dorothy Sayers, I'll show you. They also had people who aren't so well known now. This is Freeman Wills Croft. I picked this one because it's in almost pristine condition. Now, Freeman Wills Croft was an Irish author who wrote mysteries, all featuring the same police detective. He was as big as Agatha Christie or Dorothy Sayers, but we just don't read him anymore. It's He's like, he faded off into the sunset, but he was hugely popular. Um, back when he wrote in the 30s to the 50s. And so that's why, like, this one is a Penguin first edition. Because they're not, you know, I mean, it's really hard to get your hands on an Agatha Christie first Penguin edition. But somebody like this, no matter how popular he was at the time, you these, I don't even know if they came in reprints, you know. And then there's some really random ones. Really random. Like, okay, The Kiss of Death by Eliezer Lipsky. Nobody's heard of Eliezer Lipsky. This might be his only book. He was a district attorney in New York City, and he got himself a penguin mystery published, but it might be the only one. Obviously, this is a first edition, a first edition probably of no value. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it is a first edition. But you're talking about Dorothy Sayers, as Penguin went on, they changed the front. They're still green, huh. but they don't have stripes anymore. They went to graphic covers with pictures. Um, mm. And for really Penguin nerds, they get into these green, solid green ones just as much because this new design that they switched to in the whenever 50s, I think, maybe late or early 60s, is designed by a uh, a book designer named Rar uh, Marber. That's his name. Was it Romic Marber? So he was um, Hungarian, I think, from Eastern Europe, and he changed the whole cover from these stripes to what they now call the Marber Grid. Because there's something mathematical about this, about how the top, the title is always in the top quarter. And then the the some kind of graphic image, and so these marble grid covers are also collectible, but in a different way. They're more of a mid-century, a little more edgy. Um, this one, in fact, was designed by uh, Marber, but he had um, other people who used the same grid to design things. But this is a Dorothy Sayer collection. The one thing they also started to do was put little things on them, like these little white men. See him hanging there on the rock? And here he's standing on whatever this is. I don't even know. And there are, um, here he is falling down the stairs. So they put, they would pick a different image. This the little white man for the Dorothy Sayers books. And they're on all of this edition of the Dorothy Sayers book with that little, oh. the little guy. Um, so they were always kind of toying with the, with the, with the covers, of course, um, the... Now, Gillian, I think I also yeah. read that the 
color of green. You have two different colors on your shelf that they changed the green in 1945 to a little brighter uh, uh, shade. Well, that you know that could be, but whatever ink they were using, I mean, there are so many shades of green on my covers. I can't even tell. I mean, there's okay. kind of a grassy green, a forest green. If it shows up on the camera very yeah, well, it does. But they're, um, you know, they they fade over time. They get, they turn. I mean, they're they're all kinds of crazy colors. I I assume it was had to do with also, you know, ink lots available in during the war years. They probably took whatever green ink they could get. Um, the you know, so I, I I talked about how the green ones were mystery and crime. Mm -hmm. All of the color uh, that Penguin had other color tribands for different different um, types of books. So I'm, I'm doing some show and tell here. I hope that's okay. Um, that's right. Okay, so we've got so orange is obviously the one that you see a lot. It's sort of a penguin icon, the orange, because that's general fiction um, or just general literature. Some is nonfiction, some is fiction. So here's Evelyn Waugh in a classic orange triband cover and then later on they started doing what some people call a vertical triband or just a different cover um so they have th these like this and these always have an image in it where the classic triband just had the words just the title um but the orange is what you see a lot but they had other colors too they had um yellow which is just for the miscellaneous category so you've got all kinds of strange things this is earl baldwin was the prime minister so this is his book called on england it's just a couple of his speeches that were turned into a book that fell into the miscellaneous category but you've got blue for biography uh and here's maxim gorky's uh fragments from my diary in the blue cover for biography and it says biography on the side here and then red or sometimes they call it cerise was for um drama plays this is man and superman by bernard shaw so this is the the red one uh and then there are other colors too i don't have like there are some pink for travel I don't I don't have any of those there I've never even seen one over here and then they also had like this kind of sort of bright blue color don't know if you can see that but it's an uh an albatross so it's a completely different line it's still from penguin books it's published by penguin books but it is oh a pelican sorry I said albatross. Okay. it's and a pelican there was also another imprint called the puffin which was for children. For children, right. So puffins were for children. Pelicans were for science and, um, you know, all kinds of science and non uh, scientific nonfiction. And so um, the different colors. And there might be even more than that, but I've, um, the pink one I know about, other ones I'm, I'm not sure. Were any of the Penguin paperbacks actual first editions? You know, paperback first, not, not, reprint first editions but actual first editions right i um yes they were but i was trying to think about that uh this morning and i can't i can't remember i know there are some that went straight to penguin right. paperback um you know that was who published them first but i i could I, did. I see you sipping, sipping on some coffee there. Alan, our producer. Alan, a shout out to you. Get this woman a Rare Book Cafe coffee mug, will you? Hey, good. Otherwise, I'll just keep <laughs> my Zabar's cup. <laughs> your Zabar cup. The other thing I love about your collection, Gillian, is, and you mentioned it earlier, this book may not have any value, but that's okay. Collecting penguins is it's the joy of collecting, not necessarily the value of collecting. Exactly. There, and there is joy in it, at least to me. I I tend to be a completist, so I'm trying to not let that take over my penguin because there are some people who, they, they're they numbered. And so some people collect them by number and in the search for a whole set. And I don't remember how many there are, like 4,000 or something. And that's all the colors because they all, they just numbered them randomly. So if you see somebody 
who has, and you can Google to find some sometimes, the whole collection, they will arrange them by the numbers on the spines. And so you get all the different colors. It looks very uh, like jelly beans. It's very uh, cool looking. But um, most people just, you know, take what they can get and they're happy to find anything. And at least here in America, where we don't have the luxury of looking for, you know, the first editions in every number. <laughs> but you have yours arranged by color. I have mine by color and then alphabetical by author. Okay. I uh, Yeah, I... Uh, I need to be able to find what I want to read next. <laughs> well, I got to tell you what happened to me a couple of years ago. I got a phone call that somebody wanted to uh, deaccession de 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 their, um, their their book collection. And I said, oh, great, great. I'll be over. And I walked into the living room and it was the most complete uh, collection of modern first I had ever seen. And I was so excited about it, except they were all arranged by color. And I said, great, where are the dust jackets? <laughs> and she said, oh, well, we threw those away. We just wanted to make the living room look nice. Oh, uh, oh I know. That, <laughs> well, with Penguin books, you don't have that problem. I don't have that problem, except with those few that have those, whatever you said, a French cover or what a French- French flap. French, French flaps, yeah. <laughs> Yes, so I um, hope, oh, but I, I kind of have that same reaction whenever I go into somebody's house and they've taken the dust covers off. Like, where are they? Are they in a drawer somewhere? I hope so. <laughs> I know we bought a, a collection of, of Modern Library at one time that all of the the uh, dust jackets had been taken off. And the, the owner had been a book reviewer for a newspaper and should have known better. <laughs> Yeah, and those modern library um, dust jackets are amazing. Some yeah, yeah. So and cool. and his his widow kept saying, "Well, they should be here somewhere. They should be here somewhere." But she never found them. So yeah, oh, too bad. Yeah. Well, Gillian, another part of book collecting is becoming knowledgeable on the subject, and you seem to have learned an awful lot since you've picked this up in the last couple of years. I'm working on it. <laughs> So before you bought these, did you have much not? Had you ever, ever collected the Penguin books or was this a whole new field for you when you found these? It was kind of a new thing. I had seen them. I mean, I had seen, I, I had a couple orange ones hanging out on my shelf. I think maybe even I had one green one um, and I had seen them and they sort of become more popular in the last few years when Penguin started, to, well, Penguin started to reissue some of them, although the new ones, the new reissues, talk about bad ink, they seem to all fade into weird colors. Um, so I have a, a, a couple of like reissued ones that came in this big batch and they, the green covers had turned bright blue. So they just, you know, just, they, they were just bad. Um, but once I um started, I started seeing all those penguin coffee mugs around that are the tri bands with the the title of it, and I thought, well, those must be a thing. So my my little rabbit brain went down that hole, and I started looking at more of them until I found them on eBay. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing yeah. your collection of penguin paper books. Uh, we'd love to do another show with you about uh, the Rose City Reader, especially since her 16th anniversary is here. All right. Sounds good. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Lee, any farewell messages? Uh, we're looking forward to hearing more about Rose City Reader and um, I may be looking into some penguin mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Lee's a big mystery reader. Oh, very good. Oh, there's some gems on there. There's some gems in those shelves. Well, we just had a guest uh, talking about forgotten mystery writer, mm -hmm. um, forgotten mystery writer, Carolyn Wells. And so I'm wondering if some of these folks that you've got, you know, like a one volume might fall in that same category. That's right. El Eliezer Lipsky. Yeah, yeah, that one. Was, he might be the next big thing. <laughs> He might be. We'll have to do some research on him. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Thanks for joining us at the Rare Book Cafe, the Book Lovers Rendezvous. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, or wherever good podcasts are given away for free. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.